Adams shoots. West pushes it out, but Ford pushes it home. Sheffield Wednesday, one of the most famous names in British football, a unique name too, steeped in tradition. But tradition can sometimes disguise a lack of success. And Wednesday had gone more than 50 years without a major honour until their Rumbelows Cup triumph as a second division club in 1991. Looking for Pearson, he's found Pearson, it comes out to Shonen, shoot! Oh, he's there! Wednesday's scored! John Shonen's got it! The take on the lead! It's more than 60 years since the last championship success. That team's picture under the legendary leadership of Jimmy Seed hangs in the Hillsborough entrance hall. Their last FA Cup win in 1935 was marked by one of the more biased commentaries in history. Inside three minutes, Pailthorpe scores for the Wednesday. And this made Sheffield almost a nice place to live in. Now will all the Sheffield people in the audience turn their heads away? Because here is something very distressing. Boys equalises for the Albion. Well, after all, boys will be boys. Sheffield scored a second goal. Taken at a distance in order not to annoy anybody in West Bromwich. Albion equalised. At least the referee said so. But the Sheffield goalkeeper refuses to believe it. The Wednesday score again. And everybody in Sheffield give each other a pocket knife. Sheffield scored another goal, and I'm getting a bit tired of saying this. The Albion goalkeeper is very annoyed with the ball, and he nearly scores another one for Sheffield. Football reporting has moved on fractionally since those days, but after some lean years, Wednesday are back in the old groove too. Third last season, but a bit disappointing this. The second season is always going to be more difficult. I was well aware of that. I think that uh, it was a remarkable achievement by the players to get third place last year. And as you say, we went relatively close, but we've had our problems this season, uh, especially with injuries. They're not really excuses, they're facts. And uh, there have been occasions this season when I've been without seven regulars, and on one occasion, ten of my first team squad. And, uh, you know, one or two very, very important players have been missing for long periods, and obviously it's taken its toll. The name of Hillsborough will forever be synonymous with the biggest disaster in the game's history. The only benefit of that fateful day in 1989 has been the rebuilding of an already magnificent stadium. Oh, tremendous. I think it's a great testament to a lot of people who've been before, the way that they invested into the ground, and now, as a, as a result, uh, what we have to do to bring Hillsborough up into be one of the premier stadiums in Europe is a less than a lot of our competitors. We've had to plan to be all-seater by 1994, but because of what happened at our stadium, we felt we needed to redevelop the west end of the ground. We thought we could, no way we could expect supporters to actually just come on to what was terraces then, uh, where there had been the scene of so much tragedy. So in fact, we basically knocked down the west end of the ground and redeveloped that as a first phase. No matter who you are at Hillsborough, you're part of the team. Down in the laundry room, Dot Swan can remember 26 years of cleaning kit, especially in 1966, when the ground was used for a special reason. World Cup, we're here when World Cup were on, you know, when uh, Pally and all them came down here. That's years ago, I'm, go I'm going through. Well, these days, one of the busiest men at Sheffield Wednesday is the club physio, Alan Smith. A knock picked up in England's one-all draw with Norway means that Chris Woods is the latest addition to the wounded list just the day before the league match with Oldham. The situation, though, is improving a little. It's part of the function of a football club, but injury is an occupational hazard, unfortunately, in our game. And we've got to be capable of dealing with these situations. During, during September, we were very, very heavily hit by injuries, some very serious injuries. But now we've, we've overcome them, or overcome the majority of them, and uh, we're looking a lot healthier. So, George Easton <coughs> and Terry Payne. As Smith and Woods discuss Wednesday's recent visit to South Africa, they only got back last Thursday. The rest of the injured players wait their turn outside. Some, though, it has to be said, are more injured than others. Also back to the club has come the American, John Harkes, who was playing for his country against Saudi Arabia. They lost by three goals to nil. 
He's been at the club for two years now, having impressed former manager Ron Atkinson in a game for the club's reserves. He'd played for Wednesday on that occasion in preference to his country, and it was certainly a gamble that paid off. He received a three-year contract and the US Soccer Federation £75,000. It was a hectic few days, but he enjoyed being back with his fellow countrymen. Uh, yeah, I do. I've, it's been a long time since I've played. been playing with them, but uh, you still you, you go back and there's new players and uh, you still represent your country. and It's brilliant, yeah, especially building towards 1994. Where everybody's getting a bit excited in the US now, so it's picking up. We don't have the professionals on the team. There's only like, you know, four, five, six of us that are playing in Europe. And, and you can see that edge, you know, that like that, that mental attitude that we have. Um, it's your job, it's your life every single day. You live it. And it's not like that back in the U.S., you know. You go away for an international and you play. You're back home again with your family and friends. It's easy life. I kept this for one of the last at the club as well. This says U.S. soccer on it. Striker David Hurst has an outside chance of playing for Sheffield Wednesday against Oldham tomorrow. The player has been missing since the end of August when his ankle was broken by a severe challenge from Arsenal's Steve Bold. Meantime, Wednesday fans are being asked to hurry if they want seats for Tuesday's game in Kaiserslautern. Over 20 buses are now full and admin manager Sharon Lane says the club are selling the last seats on the final bus today. Seven pounds, thank you. Very well, thank you. I didn't realise how big a club it was when I came here. And just being part and parcel of it and all the supporters, I mean, the support um, is, is fantastic. So, uh, you know, it, it needs to win things and hopefully, um, you know, we can all achieve that together. Once you're a fan of a club, you're a fan for life. This last few years, really good to watch. I mean, it's worth going to watch loads, really, now. A few yards from the ground, a bus depot that typifies the spirit of a city badly hit by recession. Fierce rivalry between the fans of the two Premier League clubs in the city. And for one Wednesday supporter in particular, there are recollections of a time when his loyalties were somewhat divided. Not now. I did, I did at one time, you know, my oldest son, he, he played for Sheffield United, Steve Fortin. A lot of, lot of fans will know him. You know, a big six foot three lad he were. And, uh, and now I've got my young son, who's an apprentice professional with Sheffield Wednesday. And there's 21 years difference in their age. So at a time of depression, one young man looking optimistically to the future. At this time, especially, I think you need something. There's not a lot of room for Sheffield. I think everybody's trying to bring them down, everything they try and do. All right, we had student games and all that, but everybody put it down to me. You know, they don't give them any credit for anything they do. So, I mean, we've got two teams in, in first division, so that can't be a bad thing, and it's good. You know, they're going into Europe and that. So it's going to be a good thing for Sheffield, that. I think in the 60s, around the 60s, they started spending money on ground, but they weren't, they didn't put money into the team to me. The team were mediocre, but ground, but it's, at that time, were a, it was a good ground, but they haven't got a team to match one now. They've got a good, well, a pretty good team together, and ground's coming up with team. Alan missed that Rumbelows final in 1991, but 25 years earlier, he had been at Wembley to see the FA Cup final defeat by Everton. A great day, despite the result. The year I left school and all, and started work, and they got two goals in from, you know, and I thought, that's it now. And then they scored, they changed totally when they start, stopped playing. They thought they got it won, and they just like, passing it about, so they keep going forward. And I think they'd have won it. If they'd have kept playing like that, they'd have won it, but to me, achievement were good enough. I mean, they got a right reception when they come back. As the Oldham match nears, will Wednesday give them the chop? Preparations for guests and VIPs are all nearing completion in the two hospitality suites. And plans for the visit of Kaiserslautern are also under review. But if you think that players are under pressure, how do you fancy being a chef? A I'm a Sheffield United supporter. Basically, keep work and pleasure separate, you know, but everybody knows that here and, you know, um, my job's important to me on that side of it anyway, but, uh, yeah, my allegiances are towards the other side of the city, you through there. We do forgive people their small indiscretions every so often, so he's a good chef. One man, though, who is not remembered with affection is the former manager, Ron Atkinson. 
After swearing undying loyalty to Hillsborough, his move to Villa Park still causes a great deal of ill feeling in one half of Sheffield. Atkinson said the travelling from the Midlands was too much for him. The fans say he put money above loyalty. His face is even blacked out at the bus depot canteen. But one of his biggest supporters is his successor, Trevor Francis. One criticism that's always been levelled at Sheffield Wednesday uh, prior to me coming here was that they were a big club, but they were never, ever ambitious enough. And I think that, um, you know, they've got a lot to thank Ron Atkinson for because he came in with his flamboyant style and decided that he was going to change things. Started bringing bigger names into the club, started to pay uh, bigger salaries, also uh, bigger transfer fees. And I've taken that on since I've, uh, you know, taken over from Ron. It was only, what was it, 16, 17 months ago when I signed Chris Woods that it was the first time ever that they had spent a million pound on a player. We spent uh, big money on other players. So there has been a, you know, a, a significant transformation in, in the, uh, the style of, uh, you know, directorship uh, from, the, from behind the scenes in the last three or four years. And obviously Sheffield Wednesday is definitely on the up. Can you tell me how Sheffield Wednesday got its name? Uh, no, I can't talk about it. He uh, and you will find out after the break. Even when you play for a club called Wednesday, the day that matters is Saturday. You feeling better? <laughs> it's a lot better, yeah. Hopefully I will be, yeah. When I was younger, you know, I used to get pumped up before the game, like six, seven hours before a match, you know, or thinking about it all night. And what you do is uh, you just learn to cope with it, you know. You think about the match, obviously what you're going to do in the match, but uh, more or less just uh, at 1.30 we usually have the team talk and all that and go over what they're going to do and what our strengths are, and uh, that's when you really start kicking in. You really got to prepare yourself uh, physically and mentally at the same time. It's uh, you got to be a professional about it, you know. You know what's ahead of you, and you know what you're doing. Um, you just got to come in and try, I try to get as much rest as possible uh, flying back on the flight and uh, just looking forward to uh, today's game. And, uh, you know, you just got to build yourself up and make sure you play that another 90 minutes. The people here, I mean, the most friendliest people I've, I've been around, really, since in my hometown. <laughs> but uh, they've set to me very well. Um, Good support. Uh, it's really nice, nice people. Really friendly. The American lifestyle is a lot different than the English, and but I've been, you know, accepted pretty well. And uh, you know, once once you show that you, that you can play football and you want to really give it a go, you know, they accept it. John Hart's boots are on number eleven, which is just at the back there. He's got all his four pair of trainers there and his boots. Uh, some of the younger players, they have to clean all the boots, uh, get all the mud out, ready for, ready for all the games. On the number 48 there, we've got the boss on there, and that is Trevor Francis, of course. Uh, when Ron Atkinson was here, he had that one as well. And as you can see, he's got a very big feet, Trevor Francis. <laughs> Oops, we didn't really see that one. John is very, very important to me because, like any manager will tell you, that when you have a player who plays in so many positions as John does, he's so important. He's a versatile player, John. can play very, very well in either of the full-back positions. can play in central midfield or either on the right or on the left in wide positions. He's got the ability to defend when necessary. He's also got the ability to score uh, outstanding goals, which he's done on one or two occasions. We've got you know, one or two other very, very experienced players here who help to create a very, very happy dressing room. And, uh, you know, I don't know if it's a special atmosphere. I mean, that's for other people to decide. If there is tension before kickoff, the players do a pretty good job of disguising it with some pre-match rituals in front of a few fans who've made it to the inner sanctum of the club. Just a few miles away, the bus crews are all set to run the football specials. 
I think that people do use football as an, an escape mechanism for going out and uh, having a bit of excitement in their life. And as you stated, it's a very, it's very difficult circumstances, particularly like this week, which is going to affect this region dramatically with the with the pit closures. A lot of those people run coaches in every week to to Hillsborough, and it's going to have an effect on them, and you know they'll have a knock-on effect on football clubs. A moment of quiet before the start. Trevor Francis outlines the plan of campaign to his chosen 14. Just down the corridor, match referee Ron Groves. And the uh, Sheffield Wednesday team is Chris Woods in goal, Paul Warhurst, Nigel Worthington, Carlton Palmer, Peter Shirtley, Viv Anderson's captain, John Harks, Chrissy Waddle, David Hurst, Chris Bart Williams, and Mark Bright. Hey, hey, hey! Just the young. Uh, just got a slight knock when I was trying with England. Just a little bit of protection, a little bit of support for the game, which has been required for the last couple of weeks. But it's purely procedure, it's a bit more than that. I'm trying to get getting on this video, isn't it? <laughs> when you're in your own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I'm <laughs> A large minority of supporters do like standing. Our own cop here is a tremendous sight when it's full. It's 16,500 people. And if you ask them, the vast majority of them don't want to be seated. But uh, the government has uh, decided that that's what will take place. And so next season will be the last full season for standing. Any of the big cities, uh, they want a successful team. And I think it obviously helps when uh, the two teams in the city are playing in the first division of the Premier League. And are playing well. When Ron left, it was, you know, a terrible blow to the club. So I felt that it was uh, my aim, really, to go in there and try and continue where Ron left off, playing the same brand of football, Ron loves to play attacking football. It's also my same philosophy. I like to play open attacking football. And in front of Peter Faulkner and 25,000 others, that's just what Wednesday did. For the first 45 minutes, they tore Oldham to shreds. Two goals counted, one was disallowed. Half-time, referee Ron Groves was not a popular man, an experience no doubt that he, like other referees, had enjoyed before. As for the man from New Jersey, John Harks, well, he was given a left-sided midfield role and almost created a first-half penalty. He'd run tirelessly and, for the most part, gave no indication of the exhausting three days that he'd just gone through.
those goals by Carlton Palmer and Mark Bright were enough for a 2-1 win at the end, sending the club and its fans off to Germany in a positive mood. But a 3-1 defeat by Kaiserslautern was compounded by David Hurst being sent off, and the second leg presents an uphill but by no means impossible task. Last weekend, though, John Harkes and most, if not all, of the kitchen staff were in a pretty happy mood. Hey! I'm not very happy because you know I've been lost me once. And he's a big man. Who's picked up knots? Um, Chris Black Williams, Carlton Palmer, Peter Shirtliff has the worst injury, has a hamstring strain. We managed to get through the 90 minutes. And he, he picked up the injury after we'd made the substitutions. So it's always a little bit awkward when that happens. But uh, fortunately, um, we were able to get uh, some early treatment into him and hopefully an early recovery. I was uh, delighted with our first half performance. I think if we had gone in 2-0 up or possibly 3-0 up, we could then have uh, perhaps won a little bit easier. Uh, it's been very hectic, very tiring, uh, a lot of travelling. But it's good to get back and get the points anyway. It's good to come back here and get the points, get the result that we wanted to. That was the main thing. Uh, you know, chatting with the national team. <laughs> it's uh, a bit tiring, you know, I don't know if I'll be doing that again. And so for John Harks to the inevitable post-match discussions with local, national, and in this case, international journalists. Two Americans anxious for news of the trip to Riyadh, but probably far more interested in how Sheffield Wednesday really did get their name. It was formed as the Wednesday Cricket Club, and it was called the Wednesday because of the fact it was formed by shop workers who had Wednesday afternoon off. And they then decided to play, keep together during the winter by playing football. And so that was how the Sheffield Wednesday football team came into being.